Okay, so technology seems to work fine. Thank you. And I see oh, participants' numbers are growing. In fact, 82 right now looks very good. Um, yep, more joining as I speak, uh, even hearing 100 so. Uh, I think I think we'll get started right away because we've got a lot of ground to cover. So welcome everybody to our webinar about the key findings from the 2022 State of Startups with Industry Analyst Survey. This has been a first of its kind evaluation of the topic from the perspective of three major stakeholders. One, the startups, of course, their ecosystem with VCs and accelerators, and third, then industry analysts as well. So today, we look at the data from a perspective that will inform startups, which means we'll put at the center the responses from our startup participants and then compare these to the data that we got from participants that belong to the industry analyst group and the ecosystem group as well. So welcome again, and let's kick off. A little background about the people behind uh, the CS survey. My name is Chris Holscher. I'm an analyst relations specialist from Hamburg, Germany. I've spent two decades in B2B tech innovation management and product management and product marketing, and then kind of graduated into analyst relations. And by the way, we'll abbreviate analyst relations with AR because um, AR has always stood for analyst relations, even since times when something called augmented reality was mostly considered a medical condition. So no offense there, just saying we'll use AR as analyst relations. So my background, I've led worldwide AR programs with companies like BT Global Services before I entirely specialized on supporting B2B tech startups in leveraging AR for, for more than a decade now. I'm also the co-lead of the German chapter at the London-based Institute of Influencer and Analyst Relations, the IIAR, as well as a speaker at the AR Forum. Um, and with that background, I've initiated the SIA project. But I didn't uh, run this alone. I found a great partner in crime in the wonderful Robin Schaefer. Robin's also an AR specialist for startups and she covers the North America region since she's in New Jersey, USA. I came to know Robin first as the author of a fantastic book, I must say, titled Analysts on Analyst Relations, so a great inside perspective on the entire topic. And Robin and I quickly found that we've had pretty comparable careers, but the, the absolute best thing about her is that she's just fantastic to discuss with. So we constantly challenged our thinking, which I found incredibly productive, and also it, it was plain fun. So. I couldn't be happier that I had Robin at my side agreed uh, to, to run the SEER research with me. Um, and yeah, and last but not least, we've got Professor Neil Pollock of the University of Edinburgh Business School. Neil, um, Neil specializes in innovation and social informatics. And under that umbrella, Neil leads the Alice Observatory, where he's conducted fundamental research studies focused on analyst relations and some specifically on the effects of AR with startups. So hence, perfect to get him on board for this year project as well. Now, the, um, the business school and uh, Neil's research program uh, supported us conceptually, also with infrastructure and then especially on all things uh, data analysis, namely all the support from one of Neil's postgraduate uh, students, Alina Karkimova. Thank you so much, Alina. Um, we, we also got two sponsors for the project, um, which are two premier addresses in the industry, I must say. Um, that's one, AR Insights, uh, the makers of the legendary um, architect database and contact management system, as well as the fine folks over at Spotlight AR. That's the, the team behind the Spotlight Oz platform for AR program management. And what I like best about uh, both AR Insights and Spotlight is that they, they offered sponsorship without even ever asking to influence the questionnaire or even requesting a grip on participants' data. And I think that alone speaks for itself in today's times. So if you want to check them out, um, just Google them, their names, uh, brilliant companies, brilliant products to use in our space. So thank you again, Andy Zimmerman of AR Insights, and thank you Andrew Shu with Spotlight for your truly visionary 
and for your unconditional support. So quick flashback how it all started. I must say, I just love the expertise and the enthusiasm and the energy, really, that goes into B2B tech startups. I believe it creates a key part of our future, if not our planet, honestly. It's, um, and it breaks my heart to, to see great entrepreneurs and great teams with great potential um, fight their uphill battle to, to break into a, uh, a certain market, only then to silently be, be outplayed on a part of the B2B tech playing field that they don't even know exists, let alone know how to play it. And it's just a matter of knowledge, really, like anything else. Then on the other hand, my, my analysts that I've been um, working with over, over many years um, told me they'd love to hear more from startups, yet they cannot afford the time because many startups just don't know how to work with analysts in a way that's productive for both sides. And as a result, the, the analysts end up prioritizing more established players again, more AR savvy players uh, on their calendars. And that I want to change. Um, because that can make a real difference for all of us, I believe. With innovative offerings succeed, succeeding more often, um, and, and I think that's a really good cause. So, so changing this takes awareness, it takes education, and it requires data, because startups really want hard data to underpin their decision-making, which is wise. Anyone can tell you impressive anecdotes, me as well, but decisions require data. And that's how the CS survey idea was born in early 2021. So lots of Slack messages, lots of mind mapping, and, and, <laughs> and oh my God, did we spend love on drafting the concept and testing and refining. Um, but finally, we, we launched in September 21. Very excited. And well, I gotta say, thank you so much for every shared tweet and LinkedIn post and email. It really helped us get to some meaningful numbers. And that is around about 500 participants by spring 2022. Uh, and these 500 um, contain some 35% startups, 60% industry analysts, and a few handful of VCs and accelerators as well. H however, this, this latter group um, represent around 2,000 startups on their portfolio. So all in all, a really good base to work on. We had no regional limitation, uh, but the clear majority came from Europe and from North America. Startups had to play in the B2B space, of course, and, and they, uh, they had to be no, no older than 10 years in, in business. We've also, we've checked for duplicates and we made sure to eliminate any fake entries. Um, we even, in a couple of cases, we reached out to contributors to, to clarify on a specific answer that they gave or, or on a com comment they made to make sure that we truly understand uh, their point. Um, now, what I found very encouraging was that among the startup participants, we got a good split between active analyst relations practitioners and participants with, with no or little AR experience um, as well. And this latter group was particularly important for us because it gives us the full picture. Now, speaking of the full picture, we had an incredible amount of comments given on individual questions, as well as at the end of the survey. And thank you so much for these. First, many of your comments really helped us understand the thinking behind basically the dry percentages. And secondly, this whole exercise was very, very technical, and there is nothing better than getting real responses from real people with real thoughts um, uh, as well during, during that time. So I've picked a few rather general examples here, but many participants actually shared long-form observations, questions, even real examples. Again, amazing depth of insight that helps us qualify the data and encourage us to, to deepen the research going forward. Now, before we dive into the results, and because not all our audience I know are really familiar with the role of industry analysts, I think it is useful to establish just a baseline here. So we'd say there are two facts for some first orientation. First, let me give you a comparison. While in the B2C space, some 70% of buying decisions are influenced by a product website, in our B2B world, 
some 75%, so three out of four of shortlisting decisions are primarily impacted by industry analyst publications and direct recommendations. And that's result of, of, of research. In fact, industry analysts are consistently rated among the top one to three influential factors in B2B tech. Um, and that depends, just changes a little bit back and forth with uh, depending on, on the study that you look at. And secondly, um, let's look specifically at the B2B tech startup world. We all know that generally around 50% of startups do not survive the first four years, give and take. Now, the University of Edinburgh has examined startups who got highlighted by the leading analyst house Gartner as a cool vendor. And of these, 80% survived the first five years and many got acquired. Now, these are just two facts that hint why industry analyst relations really is a must know topic for every B2B tech startup. And of course, for every startup conference. Yet, when I look at startup conference agendas, I see the same topics over and over. It's search engine optimization, it's MVP, it's lean startup, it's investor pitches, etc., which is all good and important, but the agendas seem to be constantly missing a key topic that almost seems the best hidden secret. And we want to change that. Okay, base understanding part two. Um, in the interest that everybody can fully appreciate the value of the report findings, we've chosen six essential facts to establish upfront. So generally, as you know now, analysts are important players in the B2B tech ecosystem. They generally advise tech buyers on purchasing decisions and they advise vendors on everything from business strategy to product roadmaps and effective marketing based on the feedback that they're getting from buyers. So a very quick run through. First, Industry analysts run up to 2,000 interactions with tech vendors and buyers every year. That's one analyst. And that's a lot of intimacy with the key players in your market. Second, industry analysts are hired by tech buyers to protect them from, let's say, overly confident marketing. Third, their other role is to help vendors read the market with no filter and optimize their strategy. Fourth, very important, by design of their business model, the design of their business model, industry analysts must be impartial. In today's language, you could say, if as an analyst, you break your impartiality, delete your account. Fifth, okay, who are the players? We've got around 8,000 industry analysts worldwide with Gartner, IDC, Forrester as the big names that probably everybody knows. Then hundreds of tier two specialist firms and more hundreds of independent experts who may have had a career in one of the top houses earlier and at some point just decided to make their own thing. Six, important also, briefings are always free. If not, run away. And last not least, although we pay analysts for research and pay them for custom research and advisory webinars and so on, these are not pay for play. These are pay for time and expertise. On the other hand, paying for recommendations and paying for, um, for, for advocacy, that's a very different animal and it's got nothing to do with analyst relations. With actual industry analysts, you can only earn your validation by earning the differentiator. And this may, may, may sound like a fine line, but the differentiation is absolutely critical because it changes the type of animal that you're dealing with and it changes the value that you get too. That is not to minimize tech PR at all. Um, just be aware that different tools provide you with different value. And I've written about PR's interplay with analyst relations on LinkedIn a lot. You can dive into that if you like. It's, um, it's an important topic. Now, I hope you find that helpful up front. And um, now we got that uh, these basics straight. Let's dive into the actual report findings. So we have produced an executive summary slide for you, um, just so you have the headlines on a single slide. But I'll just skip these for the purpose of this call and, and zoom right into the data for a close up look. And here we go. Let's 
First look at startups' perception of industry analysts. First data point. Startups' perception of industry analysts. 55% of responding startups rate working with industry analysts as very important or even essential. And honestly, that's a higher number than we um, expected. This means that even some of the respondents who do not currently work with industry analysts actually think that they are really, really shit. So let's get closer. Almost 80% of startup contributors have worked with industry analysts at their current startup, previously, or both. And almost 60% at their current startup. So the sample of experience that we got is pretty high in the survey. But we've highlighted uh, here on this slide that uh, the 22% with no experience in analyst relations. And these respondents were super important for us because they give us uh, the great reference point. Now, we found the more mature a startup is in working with industry analysts, the more trustworthy and independent they actually rate them. There's a clear correlation for that. Now, I will say that at the low end of this curve, we did get some rather generalizing and, and sometimes harsh comments about analysts, often along the lines of pay to play or not seeing any value um, at all and, and, and so on. Uh, these mostly disappeared with growing AR exp um, experience. And later in the deck, we'll see that uh, the steep growth in, in trust also correlates with the maturing of the engagement type itself from simple one-way interactions to a more bi-directional strategic engagement as startups intensify their work with analysts. So I think these curves are basically a glowing endorsement, especially in times where trust is rare, um, if not extinct, really. And um, I see we've got a first question here. All right, um, Elisa. Elisa wants to know the scale. Um, yeah, which makes total sense, of course. Thank you, Elisa. Uh, we, we always used a scale from zero to nine. Um, and that way we could allow for uh, zero as an intuitive way of saying no activities or uh, don't know, and a five as the middle between one and nine, um, uh, which helps a lot with, with data analysis, of course. Thanks, Elisa. I think that puts these numbers very, very well in, in context. Thank you. So second chapter, uh, now shifting the perspective a little bit to industry analysts' motivation to actually work with B2B tech startups. And uh, believe it or not, you're incredibly relevant to them. Almost three out of four analysts rate startups to be very important or even essential to their research and their advisory work. So let's zoom in. We've asked analysts reasons why they invest their time on startups. And the, the typical answer, um, like uh, to support all these adorable, innovative, young entrepreneurs, that answer only received a 50-50 yay, nay agreement. So not quite a driver. Instead, 97% of industry analysts are keen to understand new offerings. And, and let me add another data point in that same range around 90%, I, I believe it was, which was, I work with startups to challenge my beliefs. And this tells me that industry analysts are basically basically kind of nerds like us, um, just maybe at a different point in their careers, which I find quite refreshing to, to see it from that perspective. Challenge my beliefs, that's quite cool. All right, 87% uh, want a comprehensive view of the ever-changing vendor landscape. And that's part of their core value and differentiation, really, knowing everything that's happening in their area of expertise. So. They are especially interested in new emerging vendors and disruptive ideas, of course. And you see that in 80%, specifically looking for interesting emerging vendors to track and to be able to recommend to their buy side end clients. And these are basically your potential end clients, your partners, your investors too. It's, it's really how analysts differentiate themselves as researchers and advisors. They simply get no, no differentiator points for knowing the big guys. You know, everybody knows IBM, but that's not really that interesting. Uh, that's table stakes. So 80% um, track new uh, vendors and, and uh, vendors to potentially 
recommend to their end clients. Now, what's important for you to understand, though, is analysts want to find the new gold, but they also must avoid false positives by all means. And that's because their reputation and market value depends on it. So do not confuse motivation to work with you and what you can expect from it. Which takes us right to the next slide. We've asked about the level of value that startups can get from industry analysts. And we, we asked that analysts in their self-assessment. And what stands out is that uh, strategic value ranks far ahead um, of more tactical aspects. But before we get into that, have a look at the lower end of uh, the examples here, uh, the smallest blue bar. Um, while we, we just heard of 80% motivation to identify emerging vendors for recommendation to end customers, we now shift to the perspective of expectable value. And we see that exposure to buyers comes in at only 23%. So how does that work? And that actually makes perfect sense if you think about it. Again, analysts seek and vendors to recommend, but of course not every startup will succeed in getting recommended. So the key point here is that analyst relations business model is not transactional. You cannot buy recommendations. If you're offered pay to play, run away. With actual industry analysts, you can only earn your validation, earn the differentiator value, earn, um, you know, the, the value that they see in you. Only that will let you stand on their shoulders and get the exposure to uh, that makes you stand out of the pack or, or catapult you ahead. Now, how do you do that? You leverage the strategic value that you can get from them, which brings us back to the top end again. So use analysts' breadth and depth of insights from all of their interactions with your end, uh, end, end uh, clients um, on the market and uh, the technology applications and use their pr product and strategy feedback. That's how you can accelerate your product market fit and eliminate risk along the way. Basically, you use that insight, you use that in uh, feedback to qualify towards them as a solid, reliable, quote unquote, recommendable emerging vendor. So but jumping ahead here a little bit, just remember one, not transactional, and two, um, strategic value is key. So let's look at what priorities startups are actually setting today. So you can still see the blue analyst data just faded out a little bit as a reference point, um, as light blue in the background. And the dark purple bars indicate that a much lower percentage of startups say that they have seized these value potentials so far. And that's true across the board. Product and strategy feedback ranks first on the startup perception, but 22% is still only a fraction of startups seizing this potential. And to be clear, that spread also says something about room for improvement on the, on the analyst side of the game to better reach startups and tailor their ways of working with this group. And both Robin and I are, are, are working with top analyst houses and tier two houses to help on this end as well. Now, it's interesting to see how the survey itself appears to have impacted startup awareness of that missed opportunity, because the pink bars indicate startups' expectations of what value they will be able to seize going forward. And these are universally two to four times larger. So startups are clearly discovering the opportunity here. In some cases, the expectations are even overshooting the blue analyst bars unfortunately, especially towards the, uh, the lower end of the spectrum, which creates kind of a mismatch again from the other side. So take leads here as a cross example, um, much higher expectations than what they can actually really get. So obviously there is a need for guidance to make sure that resources are prioritized to where they can actually be most effective. And I see we've got a question from Mark. Does this, excuse me, are right, here? Okay. Does this show um, on the investment side as well? <laughs> that's that's spot on, Mark. We've looked into that as well, and the answers clearly do correlate. But we'll get 
uh, to that towards the end of uh, today's session. Uh, thank you. So honestly, uh, this slide generally triggers a lot that I'd want to explain and go into much more detail. But for today, we uh, must leave it at that because now we'll look into when startups can begin to engage with industry analysts at all. We'll see that the, um, the business story is far more relevant than factors like age or size of a startup. Um, as we can see quite impressively in the data. So analysts and startups agree that the strongest driver um, to begin working together is product maturity. Um, but also situational factors, like if a peer startup uh, is suddenly discussed in analyst publications. And, um, and in third place, we have expansion into new geographies or new target segments. All of these top three are, are business story factors um, and they make for 90% of the relevant drivers. So more tactical factors such as your time in business or the revenue levels that you've achieved by now are practically, you know, almost irrelevant. And uh, revenue especially is not half as relevant for analysts as the, the startup side thinks it is. So what does the data, um, what does it mean in practice? Clearly, do not anyone, uh, let anyone tell you that analyst relations is for big companies only. Quite the contrary. If you want to break into a B2B tech market, then you must be aware of the complete playing field. And you need all the help that you can get, and you need it early. So now we look into how early you can actually get meaningful access to analysts on the basis of the leading factor, product maturity. Um, and we've got a typical timeline here from MVP to, um, uh, to beta to broad availability and on to solid reference customers. Um, blue columns represent industry analyst votes and yellow is for startups. So if you ask analysts, they want to hear from startups much earlier than startups think. A majority of, our, uh, of, of analysts want to hear in or before beta stage, even um, uh, well, you know, before beta stage, with even one in five suggesting minimal viable product as the earliest uh, feasible stage. Um, the majority of startups, however, expect the other end to be true. And I see we've got another question now coming from Peter. Um, I like this. This is great. Uh, so Peter, Peter asks, what's the difference between a pilot customer and a reference customer? Okay. Um, thanks, Peter. Um, the difference there is mainly uh, the maturity of the customer relationship. So a pilot customer is testing your product while a reference customer has formally agreed with you to get publicly quoted or even to provide private reference about the quality and experience that they had with your product or your service. Um, so, and, um, and agreed that for so and so often uh, per year uh, mm, with or even without you being present. So a reference customer passes a much higher uh, hurdle for you uh, than, than a pilot customer. Hope that helps. Uh, actually, that's a, uh, I'm, I'm really glad the, uh, you asked because uh, this kind of accuracy really matters with industry analysts. They qualify your business and they must rely on precise language. Um, just like a surgeon cannot be vague uh, when, when operating on a patient. So thanks again for the question. And actually, this is also a really nice segue um, into the next uh, part. If you, because if you consider the time between both ends, this can easily be two years or more. So between reference customer and, say, um, minimal viable product at maximum, uh, this can be a long time. And in that amount of time, getting the right analyst insights, um, helping to make, you know, basically to make bolder decisions faster, can amount to quite a competitive difference, not to speak of the effect of their publications um, directly influencing end clients' decision makers. Um, and we'll, I think we'll get to that right on the next chapter. Because now we'll look at how startups actually work with industry analysts. So, so far, only one in five startups um, leverage analyst startup programs 
And these typically include inquiry rights, access to gated research and um, key event participation. So let's look into it in more detail. Of our startup respondents, an impressive number of 59% have already been mentioned in at least one analyst publication. And if we zoom into these uh, 59%, the most common types of uh, publications were technology reports, market reports, and analyst articles in blogs or magazines, etc. So that's pretty much in line with what we expected. And, and, and these three types are really excellent starting points, to be honest. They are relevant to a broad audience, and the hurdles for inclusion are lower than for, let's say, a vendor ranking report. In fact, peppering these types of publications, um, um, the, peppering these types of publications with innovative emerging vendors is something that analysts really like to do because it demonstrates their connectedness into the sphere of real innovators. And it's also, at the same time, it's your best ticket to qualified visibility. That said, now getting into the major evaluation reports like a Gartner Magic Quadrant or an IDC Marketscape, etc., and performing well on these should absolutely be a long-term goal for most tech startups. And there are several ways to achieve inclusion much sooner, but that's again another topic. I now want to get back to, to a point that I made just on our previous timeline slide. Remember, analysts want to hear from startups notably earlier than startups think they could get access. Because of course, that correlates with first mentions. And we found that the mean age when startups get mentioned is after around seven years in business. But almost 20% within the covered startups achieve that even within their first three years. And this four years time advantage correlates with when startups begin to engage and how they do it. So if you understand the game and play it well, that means you have a real opportunity to pull forward that brand amplifier by several years even. Of course, in the end, that always also depends on whether what you do in your market is actually regarded as noteworthy by the analysts, that's clear. But the opportunity to do better is evidently there and quite significantly so. And now we'll look at what instrument startups are actually choosing to work their way towards research inclusion and other publication mentions. Because remember, this is not transactional. You cannot buy this. You have to earn your spotlight. So overall, more and generally earlier stage startups engage in minimal cost, tactical, and more unidirectional activities, such as reading publications, of which many are free, um, delivering briefings, also always free, and uh, participate in research, also free, of course. The more mature and more successful startups also leverage higher value, more strategic and more interactive act, um, activities, such as the joint production of thought leadership papers and, um, very important, buying inquiry time. And what I find interesting, though, is that only one in five startups, and we mentioned that on the chapter slide, only 22% only leverage dedicated startup programs that are offered by some analyst houses, which typically include inquiry rights, as just mentioned, access to gated higher value research and admission to analyst events. So really high value targeted strategic packages, but only used by one in five startups at this point. And that observation led us to combine the thought leadership papers and the case studies under a new category, differentiator papers, so a rather outbound perspective, and then compare this, um, this new category, if you will, to the use of inquiries and startup programs. And you can see that the outbound perspective activities have a massive 35 to 50% lead over the more insights-driven inquiries and startup programs. And we find that quite telling. And here's why. Overall, it appears that startups tend to shy away from strategic investment. That's probably for lack of money, of course. But um, that is, even though practitioner experience and value per, um, perception would advise differently. And I see, uh, I see we've got a question from Lena now. 
Okay, so why are briefings marked as unidirectional uh, while inquiries are interactive? That's a very good point, Lena, and indeed very relevant to understand. Um, so a briefing is generally a one-way information flow from the startup to the analyst. Um, and yes, they will ask you questions back. And yes, you can use the circumstance um, cleverly to make a briefing a bit more interactive. Uh, but generally, you cannot ask questions, for example. So briefings are, you make sure the analyst knows and understands your positions and your thinking. And that's why briefings are generally free. Um, with an inquiry, that's different. You have to buy inquiry time. And that gives you then the right to prepare really deep dive questions to which the analyst will prepare beforehand and they will probably pull together supportive research and data, etc. So these are 100% interactive conversations. And uh, I see my clients enjoy these very much. Um, so um, and, and take a lot of value out of them as well. So both inquiries and briefings are very important and should go hand in hand, really. Um, and an AR specialist can guide you on doing that intelligently and get the most value out of it. And, um, and I think that's in a nutshell, Lena, and I hope that that helps. Thank you. Okay, now that we uh, got data on when and how startups are working with analysts, what does the other side actually think? So 69% um, of, of analysts really said they want less marketing speak in their interactions with startups. And four or five of them say uh, that top briefing content uh, contents are um, more of a business perspective than, um, than a tech perspective, for example. So we've asked the contributing 200 or so um, analysts about their wish list for better engagement. And the top two points are less marketing speak and better quality briefings. So, and this was passionately mirrored as well in the comments. So analysts are absolutely, sorry to say that, but they're absolutely frustrated by marketing and PR mindset and techniques. Um, and the typical comment was, don't pitch to us, don't sell to us. Um, and that's clear, they, 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 they won't buy anything. They, they, you know, they seek to understand. So over 30% specifically also called for more analyst relations expertise to reduce wasted uh, briefing time and, and thereby help them justify investing more of their time on startups instead of the more AR savvy, more um, established uh, larger vendors. Now, one detail that I find very telling again is that the, the point of more comprehensive engagement gets double the votes compared to the point of a higher frequency. So again, it's not about quantity, but clearly about quality. Okay, since better briefings was uh, ranked high up, we drilled one last turn deeper into that um, question specifically. And we found that while product and technology naturally take the top spot and I find it rather surprising that this didn't come in at like 99% um, of, of uh, briefing um, topics. Um, but what's far more interesting is that uh, three out of the fi uh, top five points are core strategy perspectives for a briefing. And these align, again, not just with the early maturity of the startups, but also with the fact that an analyst on their first and potentially their last date with a startup really need to zero in on qualifying the fundamentals and decide whether this young company qualifies for him or for her to prioritize their time on this startup versus other typically larger companies. Do I need, as an analyst, do I need to have them on my radar? So, I've highlighted the um, the company vision and mission here as playing, um, I believe it's 20 points ahead of even your go-to-market approach. I've chosen this example specifically because many startups and really even multinational corporations struggle with these um, terms. What is my mission? What is my vision? Are these the same? Is it the same as my strategy? And that's clearly no, that's not the same thing. Um, and uh, and struggle with articulating 
uh, such uh, things for their company. Uh, and this is again a field where we could go hours deeper um, into each segment and differentiate an analyst briefing from let's say an investor pitch um, but that's again probably an entire webinar um, on its own. So next we'll look into how startups do and should organize their analyst relations management. So it's clear that not all startups can afford or even find an internal AR specialist. So we counted about one in four startups who do AR use external support. Now the, da uh, the base data um, here is that almost 80% do work with industry analysts. Now, if we make these 80% our base, then most startups manage AR through their C-level executives, often their founders. And to be clear, by manage, we don't uh, mean speaker roles and briefings, but really the planning, the preparation, the follow-up, etc. Um, the entire AR program. So C-level is followed by 22% in-house AR and marketing, and then followed by a surprisingly low number of just 14% who handle AR more or less uh, ad hoc. Now, the first key point here is that C-level leading AR clearly indicates a strategic importance of the topic um, for those startups who, who do it. But the second uh, point is that C-level is also clearly the most expensive resource to, to use here. Um, the resource that's probably most pressed for time as well. So it's no surprise that C-level is also most dependent on additional AR support from outside the company. In total, we found that um, uh, external support uh, to be the case in 25%, so one in four startups are working with external AR support, um, despite an internal entity taking the lead on AR. So let's look into what's actually most effective as a strategy there. Okay, probably not uh, the biggest surprise here, but analyst rate um, dedicated AR experts the most effective to lead analyst relations. But not so quickly. If we look a bit closer and do a net calculation of positive minus negative ratings, we can see that in-house AR gets a net positive advantage of around 20 points over marketing teams. And that's quite massive on a scale 1 to 10. Let me just quickly change my shades here. So, because that light in my face really <laughs> disturbs me. So, um, um, quite a massive um, advantage here on a scale 1 to, one to 100. However, again, it's quite difficult uh, to get hold of an AR specialist to hire and they're not cheap either. So let's look into these 25% who pull in support from outside the company. So we asked our analyst participants to rate VCs and accelerators and PR agencies who provide AR support and of course also rate external AR uh, specialists. And here we found that it is absolutely critical who you choose. And let me say upfront that there clearly are, and I personally know VCs and accelerators and PR firms who do an outstanding job at providing AR services. Just looking at the data that we collected from more than 200 industry analysts, the general feedback is quite clear as well. So analysts rated the ecosystem, VCs, accelerators, and PR agencies by far the lowest in, well, and in fact, net negative, if you look at the, uh, at the numbers in detail, uh, for the effectiveness of their AR support in general. So that uh, net negative effectiveness was minus 11 for um, VCs accelerators and minus eight for PR firms. On the other hand, AR specialists got rated more than 50 points better. And again, the raw data was mirrored in sometimes rather passionate um, comments as well. So what does that mean? By, by our observations, PR agencies especially um, interpret AR as some kind of special audience communications, um, often with an influence the influencer kind of approach and such mindset, um, which we must say is evidently disliked by analysts. 
So now as, as a PR firm, you can absolutely make a case to interpret AR as special audience comms, uh, absolutely fair. Um, but in light of the data and our collective experience, that does not prove very advisable. It, it just, it simply cuts short uh, the key values that we identified so clearly in terms of getting insights into the business. Okay, so in short, if you choose external support for AR, be careful not to set yourself up for an uphill battle, so to say, uh, against de facto grown reservations. Right, so last chapter now, what levels of investment are startups prioritizing on AR? And um, we found that one in four startups already invest around 11 to 100K in working with industry analysts, and that's US dollars. And 56% of startups plan to increase their activities. Okay, um, we found that around four in 10 startups spend significant investment on using industry analysts already. So we drew that artificial line at a minimum of 10 or actually 11,000 US dollars budget. And um, th by the way, this and all numbers here are pure analyst services without internal salaries or uh, without external support cost, uh, just to level the playing field. But um, uh, also to be clear, getting started with analysts doesn't have to take any investment in subscriptions. You can test the waters with free briefings. And if you do that well, um, you can get on analyst radars basically at no cost. It's a good way to, to um, really explore the options and, and justify more targeted engagement and the uh, related investment, of course. And I can say that many companies that we work with follow such a phased approach as going from zero or minimal budget to a more tailored strategic investment with measurable um, ROI then. Um, sorry, um, jumping ahead there. Um, Oh, no, that's okay. So last thing um, that we asked was then, of course, based on these investment levels, what are your plans going forward? And I don't know about you, but even um, uh, given everything that we've discussed today, uh, I find these green bars on this slide here quite impressive. And it might be that just participating in this research has already influenced awareness and interest and understanding of the topic, which uh, frankly would be a good uh, thing already. So among startups, 57% aim to increase the activities with industry analysts going forward. 16% keep them on the same level and six cut back and 9% hold off completely really. And uh, another 13% are undecided at this point. Um, and let me say that in this deck, generally we didn't speak much about the VC accelerator perspective because we felt um, uh, uh, we we didn't have enough responses for detailed analysis um, on on this perspective uh, to that level, um, but on on this simple question, we felt like it's fair to add their data to the overall pictures. And twenty eight percent of the of the uh, VC and accelerator respondents felt like they want to qualify the topic more, and sixty three percent are uh, decided to um, intensify the activities for and with their portfolio companies. Now on the analyst side, the picture is slightly different uh, because much of their capacity landscape is already um, fixed with established vendors. But uh, nevertheless, more than one third intends to spend more time with startups for all the good reasons that they gave us at the very beginning of the survey. So now I'm not sure of our last graphic is, is actually statistically accurate and I think Alina, our data wizard, will probably jump up and down now uh, because I haven't shared this with her. So sorry, Alina. Um, that's another bit of last minute ideas here. Let me go to our last slide. Um, so here we go. Um, we simply overlaid the current investment levels with the intentions to increase activities. So, or, or decrease activities, frankly. So again, I'm not a statistics pro, so it might not be entirely accurate, but I think it can illustrate to some degree just about where this may be going. So keep in mind that this resembles not your entire competition. This is only resembles your peer startups in your market. So most of the established and leading players do, of course, work with analysts and often very intensively. So, I mean, I've led global AR programs and they know what 
they're doing and why. Um, just the good news is that as a startup, you can leverage systematic advantages in analyst relations that the big guys just can't. So um, basically, you don't want to leave this opportunity to your competition, be it big or small. Also, the good news is that um, analyst relations is, is nothing new. Um, AR is a topic that you, you don't have to invent, basically. You can simply leverage the expertise that uh, already exists. Um, so from that perspective, it's actually a low-hanging fruit. Okay, closing remarks uh, for today. Um, I uh, want to close the loop with, uh, with a comment I made at the beginning today. Remember, we observed some surprisingly harsh comments in uh, startups value perception of industry analysts almost exclusively coming um, from participants who had little or no experience um, with, the, with the subject. And we asked all participants who choose to not work with analysts at all uh, what that background was for their decision. And um, on the left-hand side, we see here that 34% said it's too expensive or uh, the return on investment is unclear or it takes too long. 31% um, said something around it's pay to play, so we don't believe in it. And um, well, I hope we cleared that up today. Um, then 30% um, said it's not a must have for us or it's too early or they're too small still. We spoke about that as well. And one in five were just, just not familiar or didn't know how to approach the topic um, at all. Now again, instead of taking all these um, uh, reservations apart, um, again, I, I think it's more helpful if we actually hear the call to action behind these responses, because I think th there's clearly a call to action here. Uh, and that is basically something like, hey analysts, please, off um, please, please tailor your offerings and possibly your outreach to startups in a better way. And it says, hey VCs, hey accelerators, please go educate your portfolios or use venture partners maybe to help you do that. And to, to us AR prof professionals, it, it probably the, uh, the, the, um, the, uh, the call to action is, please do appreciate the startup specific angle to this topic. Take analysts insights into the wheelhouse, take them down to the shop floor and help startups actually apply the value right where it matters. That's our real value addition as AR pros, at least in this, um, in this segment of, um, uh, of the companies that we work for. And last but not least, for the startups, AR may not be for every one of you, absolutely taken, but you should at the very least be aware of this part of the playing field and, and qualify it and evaluate it for yourself. And that's probably our key message today. And again, Robin and I both work with analyst houses and with the startup ecosystem, with VCs, with accelerators um, to turn these calls to action into practical results. And of course, um, we're more than happy to answer uh, your questions as well. Then lastly, let me come to the combined key learnings for our startup participants. Um, and I must say what, what I'm most happy about is that all this data shows common red threads. It's consistent in itself. So the headline for me is that startups can use industry analysts much earlier and more effectively um, to one, um, accelerate key drivers uh, of their success and two, um, to de-risk that journey as well. Now, to any startup that I've worked with, these two factors are absolutely critical. And there are leading VC houses who set this in some version before. So speaking of the likes of Sapphire or Sierra or Crane or Andreessen Horowitz. But now we got hard data to underpin their and our own experience. So the six main conclusions are, one, uh, start AR early and, and practice it strategically. Two, be guided by an insights-driven approach. Three, um, focus on shortening your time to product market fit and focus on qualified visibility. And four, understand the business angle of briefings and please ban any marketing speak. It's just not useful in this context. Um, five, get AR expertise to guide your engagement and choose carefully based on your potential partner's type of approach to AR. It's quite essential. Then six, 
getting started does not require analyst investment. And if you go ahead with AR, then more advanced programs should be tailored to maximize your return on investment. So we've got a lot more depth of insight in the data and in the comments. But in a webinar like today, uh, there's only so much uh, that we can cover. And I think it's already been quite a lot. So um, basically, so how can you best make sense of all this? I guess, um, there's, again, there's a lot to digest here. And I just recommend um, you to discuss these findings with your extended team. Um, think through what it means in your specific context. Look at the established players in your field, what they do, uh, where they are mentioned. Look at your peers as well. And, um, and I think that that can inform your thinking quite, quite a lot. And I can say, feel free to uh, reach out to either Robin in the United States or to myself um, in Europe. Uh, we'll both uh, provide you the, um, the PDF version of the report, of course, and, and we're more than happy uh, to talk if, if you have questions. And with that, thanks again, I would say to the University of Edinburgh, uh, to Spotlight and to AR Insights. But most of all, uh, thank you, hundreds of survey participants for giving your time and your thoughts. Um, it's been uh, hugely helpful for us and a, and, and, and a great privilege uh, to work with your experiences. So we've got lots more data and insight to share with you. Again, just reach out to us. But for now, I say thank you so much for listening and take care.